The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. Welcome in, everybody, to the first ever uh, Saturday special. This is kind of us kind of getting ready for the college football season coming up. We're going to be covering a lot of different teams. First and foremost, covering our favorite teams here on Rising to the Occasion. Kind of covering our favorite teams, what to look for there. Uh, and then also covering some teams that may have some high expectations uh, and some teams that you know we, we want to kind of take a look at coming into the 2023-2024 college football season uh, and Currently, I mean, we're kind of in a good spot because the three uh, favorite teams right now on this podcast are Oklahoma, Nebraska, and Auburn, all three that kind of have some eyes on them between maybe new eras, uh, new new coaches uh, for Auburn and Nebraska. Of course, pretty new coach for Oklahoma as well. Uh, so t- today we're going to start off with Oklahoma, kind of getting into the Oklahoma Sooners and their upcoming season, kind of their jump into the SEC as we start to get ready for that. And I'm not alone today. Uh, we have a very special guest, a guy that is now a part of the Belly Up Sports, Net- Sports Network. Uh, and it's kind of a funny story. Uh, I was actually a part of recruiting him over, but we got Jay Smith uh, from over at Unfair Sports and the Sp- Sooner or Later Sports uh, podcast. Jay, how you doing, man? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, excited to have you on the show and a part of the team at, at Belly Up and everything, too. But, uh, I mean, our, we, we've got to talk about some college football. Not only that, but just Oklahoma football in general. That's something I'm always excited to talk about and kind of get into. I've always been a, an Oklahoma fan growing up and stuff, but... Uh, for those who, who haven't seen Jay's show, he's got an amazing show. It goes over a lot of stuff. You guys go very deep uh, when it comes to recruiting and stuff like that. You've been diving deep into that. Uh, so a lot of exciting news there. But kind of looking forward to this season uh, and what we've got going for us this season, going into the 2023-2024 season. Uh, I mean, how are we feeling about the Sooners right now? I mean, I'm probably going to be super biased because I'm very much optimistic <laughs> and excited about what the Sooners have to offer. But yeah, yeah no, over at the channel, we 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 dive heavy into the recruiting. We're going to, uh, especially this time of the year, you know, it's pretty boring. Oh, yeah. There's not much else going on. It's really just talking about the kids and that potential because I think potential is a great topic for a lot of us. We all like to see with any sports team, you love to see what could potentially happen. And then you get to live through the actual reality. And hopefully it's not as bad as um, hopefully it's much better than what you predict it to be. And so being biased, I do believe the Sooners have a very good chance of having a, a good bounce back year. You know, coach Brent Venables first year, uh, first year, last season. And as you mentioned, just like Auburn, just like Nebraska, Nebraska and Auburn's coaches, is they're in their first year. Coach Venables is in his second year here in Oklahoma. And so we, We've got a good chance to really bounce back. Went six and seven, the first losing season for the Sooners in 22 years, um, yeah. at least finishing after the bowl game. But he finished the season at 500, which is a consistent record for what the Sooners have been since the Bob Stoops era started in 1999. It's pretty exciting to see that we got a really, 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 really defensive minded coach, yeah. especially since we've watched the Sooners blunder on the defensive side and really key and critical games down the stretch during the last regime. And we kind of saw it at the end of the Bob Stoops era, in which I think that's why he decided that pass in the reins made sense. It was moving too fast for him and he needed to bring in some minds that can really move usher Oklahoma football forward and so Lincoln Riley did well it's just they didn't Mm -hmm. care about defense we noticed and it never ranked well in defense and that was something the Sooners had so going into next year I think Oklahoma has a really really good chance of showing that Brent Venables knows exactly what he's doing he's going to bring he brought most of the staff from Clemson on the defensive side here when he came um, to Oklahoma so because of that I'm expecting big things let's just put it that way yeah. yeah, I mean, I like to hear that. I mean, for those who have been watching our show, you know, I've been kind of pessimistic going into this season just because, man, last year was so disappointing. And, I, you know, I, I'm trying to take my bias out of it and looking at it from an outside point of view, uh, you know, and I, I think some of the things that, that, I, that uh, you know, were kind of concerning about last season seem not to, to really be uh, too much of a change going into the season, but I am very hopeful. I'm hopeful for something big. Um, but kind of going into this season, uh, you know, there's a lot of things to be excited about. Like you mentioned, we've got a defensive coach that is now into his second year. He's got some experience under his belt. Like you said, he's 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 finally been able to kind of put into place some of the, some of his 
uh, you know, whether it be maybe his uh, traditions or, you know, maybe maybe putting some of his guys that he actually wants in that game and stuff like that. So we're going to see a lot of new things with the Sooners. Uh, and, and going into the SEC, we need that defensive guy. Um, but what excites you or what worries you going into this season for the Sooners? To be honest, what excites me the most about this coming season with the Sooners is really the defense. Uh, when Riley left, we uh, a buddy of mine does a lot of analytics, did the calculations on it, and about 75 to 80% of the players from the Riley regime is gone from this team within a year. Yeah. So that includes guys transferring the, the last year that Lincoln was here and then one's leaving right as soon as Lincoln decided to leave. Most of those classes from, seven, from 18, 19, 20, 21, the ones that should still be enrolled, they're out. So it's been a heavy refresh. And what kept me from being cautiously optimistic the first year is, is that Venables walked in and got a top 10 class as a piece to mill class. Like they had to go in and savage some players that were decided to uh, decommit. And we had one, Kobe McKenzie, which I'm really stoked about coming this coming season. He decommitted, committed to Texas, then decommitted from Texas, came back. Yeah. When, when Coach Venables showed up. And so having that type of pool is is huge. And so then this past recruiting class for the 2023 cycle, he they, they finished with a top four class in the country. And if you're finishing with top four recruiting classes, top 10 recruiting classes, you're probably playoff bound within the next couple of years. Um, that's something that you would only see from the Ohio States of the world, your Michigans, your Alabamas, your Georgias, um, and LSUs whenever they're not, you know, having their – coach date 20 year olds you're, you're traditionally gonna have those teams in the running and so this coming season last year I, I expected better than what we had you're right mm -hmm. it was a pretty disappointing season but when I looked at the nuance behind how many people were gone and how much changes had to come through I was like yeah Stuart Mandel over at the athletic you're right he Shout out to him because he, he predicted this number right around this number. He said five and seven. He didn't see six and seven. But he pointed out specifically that Oklahoma's losing way too many people. There's yeah. too many people, too many graduates, too many, too, there's too many factors for this team to just bounce back like that. And then we lost the Heisman Trophy quarterback. That's kind of a big one. So opt my excitement is going to be the defense because everybody's been the defense for a year. Look like conditioning is better with Schmitty coming back. They look great on that side. The only thing that concerns me is a wide receiver room. And it's not because it's not talent there. It's just not very much experience. We have Jaleel Farouk, who's really the returning guy, and then Drake Stoops in the slot. But then they went out and got Andrew Anthony as a uh, another X or, y, uh, X or Z receiver to go next to Farouk. And so far, he hasn't separated himself as a starter, but he has separated himself enough that he's definitely getting a lot of game time. And then you got all the young players like Nick Anderson and uh, Jalen, uh, Jaden Gibson that we're hoping will will step up and take the job if need be. And so if that's the only place that, that worries me is definitely the wide receiver room right now, but just because we just don't have the experience, especially next to Farouk. Now, I think Farouk may have a career year. I'm expecting 1,000 yards out of him. Um, but as long as they follow their their route trees and and follow the plan, I think that with Dylan Gabriel's capabilities as a experienced quarterback, I can see that man throwing for four thousand yards. He had thirty three hundred last year, and he missed two games. Yeah. If he if he gets if he plays all of them, we, I'm thinking at a four thousand yard passing season. Yeah, yeah, and I think Dylan Gabriel is one of those quarterbacks that was kind of underrated in a lot of ways, mainly because of you know the performance that that the entire team kind of had uh, throughout the entire season, starting off mm -hmm. looking absolutely on fire last season. And man, I was just stoked when we started those first three games off, especially going into Lincoln, being able to destroy Nebraska, who, uh, let's not forget, Nebraska being the greatest 3-9 and nine team ever, uh, you know, a season ago before that, and, you know, coming really close to every big team. And so for us to blow them out of the water in their home stadium, I think that was a really exciting moment. But, uh, you know, of course, going after that, you know, I think three losses in a row after that, uh, having some tough mm -hmm. defensive breakdowns that were just small, small uh, adjustments, too. And it was it was crazy to see that it wasn't like there was huge, huge gaps that you really needed to fix a lot. It was just these small adjustments that if you were to fix these little things here and there, 
it, it could have changed the outcome of, the, of a game. It could have changed the outcome of how your defense looks. Um, but yeah, I think just more or less disappointing. I was expecting more of a seven win season last year uh, in Brent Venable's first year. And that would have been, that would have been a really good start. And I think six wins, like you mentioned, I think that was, that was really kind of a, as expected. I think he was pretty much on point, uh, keeping it kind of consistent, but uh yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think Jaleel Farouk uh, coming in, but losing Marvin Mims. Uh, and I, I feel like this is kind of a, re- a reoccurring theme for Oklahoma, though. Uh, you know, you have Hollywood Brown step up, and he leaves. And who's going to step up? And CeeDee Lamb steps up. Uh, and then you have Marvin Mims step up. So you kind of have that that reoccurring theme of who's going to step up next in the wide receiver room. Uh, the only thing on offense that really concerns me is, is Dylan Gabriel going to keep on kind of having that wide stance and overthrowing his, his, his guys again, which... I saw a little bit of that in the spring game, and that kind of concerns me um, because I think that was the biggest turnover uh, cause last year whenever I look back at, at last year and kind of what, what happened, you know, as far as from him anyways. Um, so that that's the only thing no, I think that really fair. worries me. That's a fair assessment too. And so I think the one thing a lot of us did not do was actually listen to Coach Venables when he came in and he talked in his uh, initial pressure conferences because mm-hmm. after he went through and looked at the team, he came back in a conference and said, look, we're going to rip this back to the studs. And if you know anything about building homes or just home dem- demolition in general, when you rip it to the studs, that means there's nothing there. That means it's foundation and it's beans. That's it. And so when I went back and listened to him, I'm like, oh, he saw this coming. He saw that we we have a lot of work to do a lot of rebuilding to do internally we have a solid foundation of players we've just got to build them up to where they're better and like you mentioned five games of a loss five losses of uh, like a, a score less like games mm-hmm. that could have easily bounced our direction we had it there like this season could have been 10 10 wins it could have been 10 wins and um and what three losses instead it was easy for those bounces that could have uh, gone our direction but it was discipline and understanding decisions and you're right dylan gabriel's got to get a little bit more accurate uh luckily for him he only had five interceptions over the season i'm sorry six and three of them against baylor who dave aranda is infamous for his defenses (laughs) the bigger the bigger play there would be to me is the wide receivers doing their routes. And that's where the nuance comes into. I don't want to get too nerdy for everybody, but when it comes to uh, Jeff Levy's system, it's a ratio type setup. I was listening to Joel Clapp break it down and it was quite fascinating. And it's really just the quarterback looks for where they can overload the defender. They figure out where the overload is and they go for it. The problem is, is the wide receiver supposed to recognize that too. Mm -hmm. And if the wide receiver doesn't recognize it and misses his route or misses his timing, every pass Gabriel throws is going to be bad. And so there's some plays where Gabriel was off and there's some plays the wide receiver wasn't where they were supposed to be. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's just when you dive into the nuts and bolts and the nuance of what was supposed to happen, you start to get it, which most fans don't. We don't have the time or the mental capacity to understand truly how that stuff works. But you're, I agree. I do want, um, I do want Gabriel to get better. Mm-hmm. at just being more accurate and being more of a leader as far as guiding the receivers when he feels like they're not doing what they're supposed to do. I think Farouk is ready for that role as well. And so, yeah, if there's a concern, it would be just Gabriel doing what he does. But the other thing is he threw for, he was the second, he had the second most yards in the, uh, the big 12 behind uh, Max uh, Duggins. Yeah. So, I expect another 3,300 yard plus season out of them too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> especially absolutely. with the running backs we got. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a very exciting year, and and that's the good thing too is that whenever we brought Brent Venables in, it wasn't like we got Brent Venables as defensive minded coach that we were going to switch to only defense. He was smart and went mm-hmm. out and got one of the best offensive line or uh, offensive minds in in the the game right now too. So Jeff Levy is definitely up there. Uh, you know, I'd I'd put him up in the top ten easy for offensive minds right now and what he's doing uh, just because he's he kind of is is on that that same level of trying to you know go with the speed of the game and kind of follow in with it uh so it's it's definitely a good move for Brent Venables to bring him in I think and uh you know I, I heard a lot of people trying to you know scream out and a specific way Oklahoma fans scream out to to fire Jeff Levy you know thinking that he was the issue but you could tell his his schemes were working when they were on point you know and when players were kind of filling where they needed to be filled in at and stuff but uh, kind of going into the into Brent Venable's second season, uh, you know, we kind of talked about where uh, where our worries and, and maybe where we're excited uh, for his second season. But 
what would be the expectations for Sooner fans or uh, really for any college football fans for Oklahoma this season? Because I think some people are looking at them thinking it's going to be a huge bounce back. Some people are looking at them and thinking they're just going to have the same repeat year uh, or is it going to be somewhere in, 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 in between the two? Yeah, I'm, I don't think it's going to be a repeat. I uh, most A lot of fans are a little concerned. I have to put it like this. Sooner fans are spoiled. <laughs> Absolutely. We're spoiled. We're very much sport. We're used to having a Heisman Trophy contending quarterback every single year. We've had one since 2016. You know, you go from your Baker Mayfields to Kyler Murray's to Jalen Hurts to Caleb Williams, and then you have Dylan Gabriel. And with Dylan Gabriel is a really good college quarterback. He's just not someone that's going to beat and win every game by himself. You know what I'm saying? That is the difference maker behind what they had to do with the old regime was they had to just figure out how to win without actually playing defense. It was mm-hmm. not nah, just put the team on your back and carry them. And we watched Caleb do that as a freshman. And that's how we ended up in the season. We did that year is there were some games that we got lucky and it was the game. The bounces went our direction just because the quarterback was able to do a last minute heroics. When he snatched that fumble away from his own teammate and ran it for a touchdown. It's like, Oh, okay. We're, we're just, we're just doing trickery here. This yeah. is not something that was designed. We're just going to go out there and play street ball. Yeah, we're just going to strip it from our own guy, which is totally unheard of and totally not in the game plan. <laughs> the the refs were even exactly. confused it's on what's going to happen. <laughs> like, is that a legal move? Did he drop I mean, the ball and he grabbed it or what happened? Yeah, like, I, yeah, I don't see anything in the rule book that says he can't do it. <laughs> right. I mean, we don't just do stuff just to do it. But, I mean, is it legal? And that's that's where – and that's my point behind how things are so different when it comes to that is you don't know – um, you, you got to have that guy that's going to be just all heroics and you don't know who can, who's going to be able to do it. And I didn't never thought that Dylan Gabriel was that guy. Mm-hmm. I thought Dylan Gabriel was a guy that would balance your team out. He'll give you good offense. He'll give you good passing. And he's, he's sneaky fast. He can scoot. We watched him run 67 yeah. yards against Nebraska. Absolutely. So he can, he can scoot. And all you need him to do outside of that is, to um, make sure that the defense is honest. And so he does that, but he's not the guy that's going to put the team on his back and just carry them. That's never been his MO, nor um, is that been in his game. So because of that, you got to hope that, you know, the team will be balanced more. And Venable said it best the other day in an interview, uh, actually yesterday, after um, uh, Wednesday when they did the SEC schedule, he did it in an interview because he was there in person at a, at a restaurant in Norman. And he said that if we get ourselves, if this t- if this defense turns out a top 40 defense, we're probably going to be going to the playoffs at the end of this year. We could be holding up a trophy at the end of the season. And I agree with him. I th- This year's schedule is pretty cake. Yeah, We leave the state twice. And I don't count Dallas as leaving the state because that's actually North Oklahoma because we own it. Uh, but we leave the state twice this season, three times this season. So you go to Cincinnati, you go to Kansas for Lawrence, which is a five hour drive. And then you got uh BYU. So technically you fly two times, mm-hmm. Cincinnati, BYU, technically flights. You can drive to KC to Lawrence, which is only a five hour drive. I've done that a few times. And then every other game road game is in state drive to Tulsa hour and a half drive for the well, two hours from Norman, but hour and a half, two hour drive to Tulsa for that game. And then um, Oklahoma State. Like when you look at it, it's like, wow, where do the Sooners really have concerns with this season as far as road and stuff? uh, UCF comes here. Mm -hmm. Um, You got the Red River. You've got um, everybody else coming to town. And also, guess what? We don't play Kansas State this year. Yeah. Thank God. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> the team that has always had the Sooners number is is out. They're out this year. We don't play them again this season unless we see them in like the Big 12 championship. And, and I so, don't think Baylor either, right? Uh, if I remember nope, correctly. I don't no think, Baylor. I don't think there's a Baylor on the, on the schedule. State so. coming to town. Yeah. No Baylor. Uh, see, TCU comes to town at the end of the season. So the, looking at overall, no Houston. It's pretty favorable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty favorable this year. So, um, this year, cautiously optimistic. No excuse to not go ten and two. Okay. No excuse. Yeah, all I it like is it. is bouncing, the ball bouncing where it should b- bounce. Ten and two. I like it. I like the I like the 
higher expectations what I'm looking at. I mean, I, I, I'm not thinking they're going to come out and repeat from, from last year at all. I, I definitely expect seven wins this year. I think if you go less than seven, mm-hmm. uh, then then we were very disappointed. I'm I'm okay with eight eight wins this year uh, personally, uh, just because I'm trying not to give too too high of expectations. But I think it's also me trying to hold myself back from from tears at the end of the season uh, if it, if it ends up coming down to that again. Um, but no, I, I, I like that. And I you're like, right. I like the optimism a lot. Hey guys. Before we go any further in the interview, we are going to jump back into it, talk a little bit more about Oklahoma and everything with Jay. But before we do so, we want to bring up the sponsor of this video, and that is Mahler Bros Golf. Mahler Bros Golf is not only an amazing golf business that we know the owner of, yours truly, um, but it's also what powers this podcast. That's what makes it so special to us, um, being able to do everything and be able to provide everything that we need for this podcast and be able to give you guys everything that we try try to give as far as content goes and everything so it's extra special to this podcast but you can go over and check out Mahler Bros Golf uh, it's MahlerBros.com M-A-H-L-E-R-B-R-O-S.com and you can use code RISING2 for 10% off just for being a listener of this show and you can check out all of the amazing polos uh, we've got hats we're going to be creating new hats very soon and an amazing announcement very new to the site is some coffee uh, it's not completely c- completely all good to go and looking professional yet on the site um, but you can search for some coffee we have the first ever that i know of a golf themed coffee brand uh, so we're very excited to bring that we're going to bring some new mugs and stuff like that to kind of go along with the coffee very excited for that uh, i'm actually wearing one of these these golf polos right now this is the white camo uh it's an amazing feel it's very stretchy as you can see very stretchy this is a classic fit i wear a medium and classic fit but usually i wear a large the slim fit i I encourage everybody to order a size up in if you're going to try that out but I, I love the slim fits. I think we've got uh, quite a few extra designs in slim fit, but we're, we're trying to add to all of the designs. Uh, an amazing product. Uh, I, I really do stand by the products that we make, the products that we sell, and uh, we're, we're constantly adding to and trying to build that brand. So you can help us out by going to MahlerBros.com. That's M-A-H-L-E-R-B-R-O-S.com, and you can use code RISING2 for 10% off. We thank you all so much for your support. Let's get back to the interview. No, no, you're fair for that. I mean, it's a fair thought. I mean, I'm looking at the schedule now. There's no reason to not be 5-0 and going into the Red River. Yeah. Like, you've got Arkansas State, SMU, which is actually not a bad team, but I don't expect them to – I don't expect them to be good enough to beat Oklahoma this year. Going to Tulsa, that's definitely a blowout. Um, Cincinnati could be a challenge, but Cincinnati has a new coach, yeah. new quarterback. Yeah, a lot of, yeah, a lot new, of new teams, pieces. New everything. So that's a, that's, that's a recipe for losing. Yeah. As we've seen with most new coaches in their first year, recipe for that. And then Iowa State coming to town. As much as I like Sam uh, Decker, I don't think that he's ready to win. We beat them at in Ames, so I can mm-hmm. expect as soon as we win that game. And then you got, you know, a top, it should be a top five Texas coming, uh, unless Texas loses to Alabama really, really bad. You got top five Texas October 7th. That game right there to me is going to be the, the, the critical one because the good thing is that uh texas will be um if, if you really look at it texas having that that game against alabama that's going to be the test to tell us what they're going to look like this season yeah and if oklahoma can go there beat them that's a good way for um oklahoma to continue to propel themselves and like venable said compete potentially for hosting up a trophy at least the big 12 championship yeah. The antis- the expectation based upon Vegas, Vegas has Oklahoma and Texas at nine and a half. Mm-hmm. That's their over under set. And if I'm correct, the favorite points is going under the nine and a half and the dog money, the plus is, is going above. I think it's like a plus 140 if you go over. Mm-hmm. And if that's the case, oh, Vegas really wants you to take under nine and a half. They desperately want you to take over nine under nine and a half. If you take under nine and a half, you're going to make Vegas a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I mean, so I'm, I'm saying I'm, no excuse. No I'm, I'm definitely one of them that, that was kind of a sucker for the under, just because I'm. Again, I I, I'm, I don't place any bets on my own team. I learned that the hard way. I'm just not, I'm not doing it. Uh, you know, I'm gonna going to stay out of that game, and I'll, I'll just let them do their thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm that guy that will bet against my team. 
just yeah. because I would prefer to lose money and then win than to win money and then lose. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Well, I like it. I, I rather I, I rather bet against them so that if I lose, I win money and it pacifies it. Yeah, but if I lose <laughs> makes, money, I'm not upset because my team won. <laughs> yeah, makes up for <laughs> makes up for the hurt. Uh, I, I like that a lot. Exactly. Um, but you know, if, if we start to look back to last season and and that does repeat this year, let's say they only have. Maybe let's just let's just say he has another six win season. I don't think Brent Venables will go under six wins. Uh, I think that's kind of uh, ridiculous to even think that, especially like you said, we we do have an easy schedule coming up. Um, but if he does only reach six, um, even even at seven, do you think Brent Venables is starting to get on the hot seat, uh, or do you think fans, will, you know, fans and the university themselves are are, are going to understand and give him give him more time? So fans are definitely going to put him on the hot seat because they're <laughs> going to expect excellence day two of a complete retooling. And But the administration won't. I don't expect yeah. the administration to consider cutting ties with Venables until probably after going into the SEC and we don't look like we're competing there. And I say that specifically because um, we've watched a Brent Venables defense win two national championships. Mm-hmm against sec schools we've seen him play three games in national championships against sec schools and this is recent history this isn't something that's happened like 20 years ago like he did when he was here for the 2000 national championship those clemson defenses were competing and we used to clemsoning was a verb back in the day we called that as you know that if you're clemsoning you're probably gonna lose this game you're gonna be up by two three touchdowns you're gonna lose so he was able to pacify that and allow the generational quarterback talent they had just do their job they slowed down everything else around it made it to where it was tough heck when we played them in the playoffs venable's defense he knew exactly what to do against lincoln riley and them he just had he's like oh yeah their line is nimble and and small get those big defensive linemen out there get our big offensive linemen on them and just lean on them make them tired and then when wayne gallman saw that in the second half he was like oh they're tired give me the ball and he just ran it down our throat they knew what to do the defense shut us up in the whole second half because first half we was up at halftime Second half, they shut us down because he knew how to adjust and be prepared for the Lincoln Riley type offenses. And so because of that, the administration will give him time. Well, the fans, probably not. They're, 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 we're spoiled. Yeah. We're spoiled. We're a spoiled fan base. And so I tell everybody, just relax the Aaron Rodgers way. Just relax. Let the man um, do his job. Let him get the players in first because it's going to take – he's gotten two cycles, top 10 cycle, and the majority of the players are still here. He's only lost one from that cycle. Two. He lost two from that cycle. Um, in this last cycle, we lost one. Um, he had a family situation, so he ended up uh, hitting the portal after his first semester. And so we we still got top five recruiting classes that now need to be integrated into the game. And when they start playing – You'll see a different animal out on the field. Yeah, yeah, and I, I like to hear that too. And um, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I think I think Oklahoma fans are absolutely going to put him on the hot seat if we don't win the Big Twelve as as we're going out. You know, I think that's that's just kind of been the expectation, not just at Oklahoma as as the team, but also as the fans. You know, you expect to to win six straight, so let's let's keep it going. Um, but you know, right. and, and that's that's a big expectation. And and I think that there was even some talk from some fans last season, which was just ridiculous. Uh, and, and to expect him to have done too much better than he did last year uh, really was way out of line. Kind of kind of makes me think, and I don't put Brian Venables up at, at the uh, same tier as Ryan Day yet, but it kind of makes me think of Ohio State fans. I lived out in Ohio State or in, in Ohio uh, for the past six, seven years, uh, and, and being out there here to the Ohio State fans recently, you know, after this past season losing to Michigan twice, they're calling for their head coach. You know, it's a very similar situation. Uh, you know, with with uh, crazy fans that are you know they're they're going so crazy that that they're kind of starting to be delusional and, and thinking that that something can be made of nothing um but man let's let's go over to our sec schedule as that's now been released very exciting stuff we were kind of really sec fans all around uh have been waiting to hear what the sec is going to look like when oklahoma and texas come into town uh and it's it's a lot of fun to to see that union uh, that that uh, i guess yeah i guess the the union that the joining of of the two teams coming in and and seeing how well 
they did this. Uh, and, and looking at it at it overall, uh, I don't have my computer here with me today, so I'm having to use my phone. Um, but pulling it no up, problem, you know, I got it pulled up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, looking at this schedule and seeing what's in uh, 2024. So we've got uh, Texas, Alabama, Tennessee, and South Carolina all at home, and then for away in 2024. Uh, we'll see Auburn, uh, LSU, Ole Miss, and Missouri, which uh, Blake and I, um, one of my other co-hosts, uh, he, him and I are, are already uh, ready to go to that Auburn game together. So, you know, we're, we're ready for those tickets to come out. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's exciting to see this. But I, I look over at, at Texas and what Texas has on their schedule compared to Oklahoma. Oklahoma's being put through the gauntlet. <laughs> I mean, for for our home home games, we have Alabama, Tennessee, South Carolina. Those are three pretty tough teams, especially the way that South Carolina is starting to to kind of be on that that uh, incline a little bit. And Tennessee just on on one of the best seasons they've had in a long time. Uh, and then our away games: Auburn, LSU, Ole Miss. Uh, you know, an, an easier game at Missouri, but that's still not. Uh, easy uh, per se. Uh, so I mean, just some yeah. some an, an insane schedule. But uh, you know, how are we feeling about the move to the SEC? I know I, I think a lot of fans were both, you know, kind of a little a little skeptical about how it would go. But now seeing the the uh, the release of the schedule, I think fans are starting to be a lot more excited about the move. Uh, is it something that we should still be nervous about the program and the and the trajectory of of what the program is going to look like going into the SEC, or is this something that we should be pumped about? Oh, pumped. The beauty of it is football. Yeah. And the best part about moving to the SEC is you're going to see a lot of people who are really passionate about football. Um, I've done a few tours around SEC schools. I've done some games. My other team, if, if you know, as a sports fan, is the Tennessee Volunteers. So my SEC team was always Tennessee. Big 12 team was Oklahoma. And I had kind of adopted a Big 10 and a Pac-12 team, but we won't talk about that right now because those are going to be deleted right now. But... <laughs> I've gone to some games at Nayland Stadium. I've been to Death Valley. Um, I've been out to Arkansas and, and, and checked out some games. They care. And tailgating there is dramatically different than it is through what we've seen here at Oklahoma and any any road games in uh, Oklahoma. Like, they, we tailgate, but they tailgate. Oh, like yeah. it's, I think Oklahoma is probably the closest I've seen. I haven't been down to Texas State. I haven't been to DKR, which mm-hmm. I want to. Um, but I've never been to DKR. I don't know how they set up, but I know here in Norman, they'll, I know people that get up at six in the morning and they're starting, they're putting their stuff up, their campers and they're preparing mm-hmm. it. So they tailgate but there, man, it's everywhere. And it's like the whole campus is basically now a tailgate corner for these games. And so it's going to be exciting to be able to make these road trips and you're going to see some massive stadiums for Oklahoma fans. The thing that sucked about, being in the big 12 is that um and it's the only thing that sucks about the ou texas game every year being the cotton bowl is that you don't get to go down to that hundred uh seat stadium in uh, austin um because everybody else in the big 12 is roughly in the 70 60 50 range so you got a bunch of smaller stadiums you're going to stc there's four of them over a hundred thousand seats five over a hundred thousand seats six when you add texas then you add in everybody else is at least in the 90s, uh, except for when you get to Missouri, Vanderbilt, and maybe South Carolina. But everybody else is up there in the 80s and 90s. So you're going to be up to massive stadiums. Yeah, It's going to be amazing to check that out. And so looking at this schedule, I'm kind of on the opposite spectrum when it comes to the difficulty of this. I don't think this is a hard schedule. And this is the reason why I say that. Alabama's probably your toughest game. Yeah. But the good thing is you got them at home. And we don't know who their quarterback is. Right now, they have three quarterbacks. means they have zero quarterbacks because they have no clue who's going to be their starting quarterback next year. They have a new offensive coordinator in Tommy Reese who's figuring it out today. Defensively, they're going to beat Alabama, so that's who they are. But offensively, they've seen some turnover at wide receiver. A lot of dudes hitting the portal. Um, they don't have – Tommy Reese has to write the ship on the offensive side. Defensively, it'll be fine, but offensively, he has to right the ship. And so until we know who's throwing the pill, I'm not scared of them. Tennessee, South Carolina, they've only got one problem. We already know everything about them. And why is that? Josh Heupel's the head coach of Tennessee. His roommates are, are coaches on this staff. His former college roommates, they're coaches on this staff. Brent Venables was his defensive coordinator when he was throwing the ball at Oklahoma. So everything that you can expect out of Josh Heupel when he was offensive coordinator here as well, 
we know him. We know what to expect out of him. South Carolina, Shane Bieber was a coach here. Everybody here knows him. So we're not walking into situations where, as well as they're both going to be having new quarterbacks. Now, Tennessee has Nico, who to me was the, uh, if you don't know Nico, Ilama Lueva, he is, he was the highest ceiling quarterback in last year's class to me. He was, I think he was ranked uh, consensus fourth, but I thought he had the highest ceiling. I thought he's, his ceiling is higher than Jackson Arnold's, who's our quarterback. But I think Jackson Arnold was the best overall quarterback that was yeah. in that class last year. But Nico is a monster. and But this will be his either redshirt, freshman, or sophomore year. So they'll have a new quarterback. South Carolina, Spencer Rattler will be gone. They'll have a new quarterback, and I have no clue who they've brought in to be his successor yet. So from there, when you look at it, we don't know who their quarterbacks are. Only thing that scares me defensively is Alabama because Alabama always has a good defense. Tennessee doesn't play defense. We saw that this past season. <laughs> so Heupel's trying to figure that out now. Uh, I've heard so many Tennessee fans say they want to fire their D.C. because they were giving up too many points, and they got their butts kicked by South Carolina, who got their butts kicked by Clemson last year when Brent Venables was there. So we know these teams coming to the house. I think I'm good on those. The, the road games, though, Auburn has a new coach this year in Hugh Freeze. We got to see what that's going to look like. I think it's going to be a dumpster fire. LSU, Brian Kelly would be his third year. And Death Valley is a tough place to play. If it's at night, oh, if it's at night, go to that game. It's going to be amazing. But I think that they'll have Nussmeyer as their quarterback. And I'm thinking they'll probably be pretty good. So they're a concern game. Oh, Miss hey, Coach is Lane Kiffin. I'm never scared of Lane Kiffin. I'm just going <laughs> to be out there and put it out there up front. Lane Kiffin, I, the Lane train is going to crash somewhere. That dude is, you know, I'm not worried about them. And, of course, Missouri is going to be the cakewalk game. They'll be in a fire at their coach probably by the time we play them. They have a new coach in, and then he'll end up getting himself fired too. They haven't done anything since winning, since leaving the Big 12 and winning the SEC East two years in a row. They've, they've just fallen off the map. And so for Oklahoma, that Alabama game and LSU games are truly concerns for me. Texas, because it's a rivalry, it has to be a concern. But for Texas, they got Florida coming to the house, in which Florida doesn't mind playing in the South in hot weather because they're in Florida. Yeah. So that's like every day for them. We'll see what Billy Napier looks like at that point, but they'll have DJ Lagway as a sophomore or a redshirt freshman, so they may actually have some quarterback play. Georgia's going to be a concern uh, defensively. We don't know who their quarterback is either. They've got like three five-star quarterbacks who aren't going to probably play this year. But Dylan Rayoli is going to be there, so we'll mm -hmm. see what they look like. Kentucky's a Stoops, and we know that us, Mark Stoops probably gonna, is going to give Texas hell because, well, unfortunate, well, fortunately and unfortunately, Mike Stoops is the linebacker coach there at Kentucky, which will probably help them against Texas. But the good thing is he isn't the defensive coordinator. Um, and then Mississippi State is – We'll pray for them because we don't know what's going on with what, what they're going to look like. They lost mm -hmm. a legendary coach, RIP yeah. Mike Leach. We don't know what they're going to look like coming into this season um, because uh, I think Arnett's going to be a fine coach. He's a defensive-minded guy. But their OC coming from Appalachian State, uh, baby, uh, 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 baby, we don't know what his offense will look like with the players that they have. He's not going to be running Leach's offense. But he did go down to Texas A&M and beat them last season. So I don't think I can be too concerned about how they play. And then that Texas A&M game on the road for Texas, though, might be bad. That's, that feels like a, um, that, that, that feels like a, a, a trap, and so does Arkansas, only because Sam Pittman will probably be riding into that game after a 10-2 season. And if he's coming into that one after a 10 and two season, new quarterback's going to be there as well. But I think he's going to have the, the, the momentum pushing him to where they're going to look good. So gauntlet wise, I think Florida has the worst schedule, but I do yeah. think that uh, this is going to be a challenge for both Oklahoma and Texas, but it will be fun. It's going to be college yeah. football. There's nothing. We're not playing Georgia and Alabama every week. Yeah. So remember that uh, fans um, for Oklahoma and even Texas fans. Remember, the SDC has won, what, eight of the last 10 national championships? We'll just throw that number out there. It's close, but uh, roughly about that, right? Mm -hmm. It was like Alabama and Georgia and then won by LSU. 
when everyone in the SEC wins a national championship year after year after year, like it's like alternating between them, then I'm scared of the SEC. But yeah. right now, we don't play Georgia and Alabama every year. We'll beat the rest of these teams. Yeah, yeah, and and, and that's that's the thing too. You bring up a really good point in. You know who has won so many of these these recent national championships, and it's a it's a conference, <laughs> it's a conference that's taken over, and it's mainly because of you know whoever makes it out alive in that conference is going to be battle tested. Uh, you know we talk about being battle tested coming out of the Big Twelve for you know for basketball, uh, you're battle tested coming out of the SEC in football. So uh, yeah, it's it's going to be really exciting. Um, I, I I totally agree with you. I think Oklahoma fans and Texas fans should both be extremely excited for that reason, for the most part. Yep, it's not going to be as bad as you think. Everybody's yeah. afraid, like oh, they're it's, it's the SEC. It's going to be so tough. Now you're going against big boys, and our big boys will be prepared for those big boys because we're going to have big boys too. But if you're not playing Georgia and Alabama every week, SEC is not going to be that tough. I I, re, I recall recent memory in us blowing out Florida in a bowl game and Auburn in a blow, bowl game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be really exciting. Uh, like like we've mentioned pretty much, pretty much this whole time going in, uh, we've got a lot of excitement coming between, you know, the Brent Venables era year two, uh, and then now we've got uh, going into – the SEC uh, and just seeing how much more real it feels now that the, the schedule has been put out there and who we're going to be facing. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of excitement. Um, but Jay, man, we, we appreciate you so much for coming on. Uh, let everybody know where we can find your stuff. Yeah. Thanks for having me. You can find me unfair sports. Just search for me on YouTube. We talk, OU football, college football in general, and then the podcast is the Sooner or Later Sports Show for Belly Up Media. You can find that just by searching it. So it's why I talk basically all um, Oklahoma stuff and uh, mix in a little bit of just college football news whenever we're talking with some guests. So thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, anytime you want to listen to some good college football content, especially whenever you just start getting into Oklahoma as an Oklahoma fan, but even if you're if you're not an Oklahoma fan, uh, you guys you guys dive into a lot in college football, so it's a lot of fun. Uh, go check him out, Unfair Sports on YouTube, and sooner or later, Sports Podcast. Um, but everybody, if you watch this far, we thank you so much uh, for all of your support. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell if you want to know when we post on YouTube. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, give us a five-star review. It helps us out a lot. And we thank you so much for all of your support. And until next time.